I would like to welcome everybody here to our uh, ECAR November legislative meeting. Um, I am uh, Greg Hanner, uh, the 2020 ECAR president, getting used to these virtual meetings, unfortunately. And uh, I now call the Eastern Connecticut Association of Realtors uh, legislative meeting to order. And as Susie said, uh, the meeting is being recorded. A little bit of Zoom housekeeping. Just want to remind everybody that we will put you all on mute so that the recording is picking up the speaker 100% of the time. We do encourage use of chat. Uh, we will be uh, monitoring the chat and try to put in any questions that come up uh, as needed. And the um, speakers, if you could just remember uh, to turn your phones off and that way you won't be interrupted when you are speaking. And uh, with the 2019 CTR Realtor of the Year and this year's Government Affairs Chair, Marilyn Lusher, please come and uh, start us off today with the invocation and our salute to the flag. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everyone. Under all is the land. Upon its wise utilization and widely allocated ownership depend the survival and growth of free institutions and our civilization. As realtors, we recognize that the interests of the nation and its citizens require the highest and best use of the land and its widest distribution of land ownership. They require the creation of adequate housing the building of functioning cities, the development of productive industries and farms, and the preservation of a healthful environment. Such interests impose grave social responsibility and a patriotic duty to which we as realtors should dedicate ourselves and for which we should be diligent in preparing ourselves with a common responsibility of integrity and honor. This was quoted directly from the preamble of the Realtors Code of Ethics. Today, we, lift, we meet to lift up our friends and colleagues, our public officials elected to state and national positions, and those who seek to hold office in local government. As realtors, we understand our responsibilities, both personally and professionally. This year, more than ever, it is obvious that we work and live in challenging times. I put it in the microwave to heat it up again. We seek patience of each other mm -hmm. as we strive to cooperate with each other keep each other safe and come together to make a difference when it comes to political advocacy for property rights. We express our thanks for an opportunity to gather together and be thankful for the gift of home ownership that we facilitate, the leaders who uphold our constitution and for the bounty our industry has provided. For all of this, we are thankful. And now for the Pledge of Allegiance. pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Marilyn. And while we've all been busy uh, selling real estate during the last several months, uh, your local and state associations been also busy helping us uh, stay up to date with the COVID-19 updates that have helped us through these unprecedented times and remain an essential service. We've come together uh, charitably and conducted business in a, uh, responsibly to keep our association viable. And you'll be glad to know we've welcomed 16 new realtors and three new affiliate members since last month. One of our new members is on the call today. I'd like to welcome uh, Marios, uh, I'm gonna butcher it, uh, Bicarius, uh, who's the owner of Prime 82 locally right in Franklin. Tomorrow is an important day. Uh, it is the annual election of the 2021 ECAR officers and director. Uh, the ele annual election opens for the uh, 2021 ECAR officers and directors and it's uh, proposed by the nominating committee who spent a lot of time and consideration. And it's also been approved by your 2020 ECAR board of directors. The electronic voting will be open uh, from October 15th to the 22nd. And it's important to note that per our bylaws, we need a 10% participation rate. So please do your part 
and vote electronically for your uh, slate for the 2021 year. Right now, I want to ID the fact that we are very fortunate to have an active group of local, state, and federal legislators with us today on this call. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to acknowledge Senators Dan Champagne, May Flexer, Paul Formica, Kathy Alston, Austin, um, Heather Summers, Representative Holly Cheeseman, Christian Connolly, Kathleen McCarty, Brian Lanou, and Pat Wilson. Phineas, I've never said your last name, but sorry if I butchered that. Did I miss anybody on that uh, list? And if I did, we'll get to you for sure with hey, Bonnie. We'll, go hey, ahead. Yes. Yep. Kate, Representative Kate, Kate Rotel is here. And Representative Kevin Ryan. Awesome. Here today are also the CTR uh, Connecticut Realtors General Counsel and Government Affairs Director, Jim Heckman, and uh, Connecticut Realtors President-elect, Carol Christensen, who's in our uh, family in terms of association. And we're especially honored to have today on the call, U.S. Congressman Joe Courtney and NAR political analyst, uh, Kristen Hoisted, for as our featured guests. And in the interest of staying on our agenda and time, uh, I will thank and recognize our affiliates at the end. So Carol, would you like to give us an update on what's happening at the state level? Good morning, everyone. As the incoming president of the Connecticut Association of Realtors, I would like to welcome everyone today and especially the candidates who are joining us today. Each year, the Connecticut Association of Realtors reviews their public policy statement. If you are a public official or candidate, it provides you with information that can be helpful as you formulate your own positions. If you're a realtor, it will help guide you in evaluating where the candidates stand on topics important to our business. CTR's public advocacy role serves two purposes, to protect the interest of state owners and prospective home buyers at the state capitol and in Washington, D.C., and to improve business climate for the members of the Connecticut Association of Realtors. Our public policy statement focuses on six areas, housing, zoning, land use, and smart growth, fiscal, the real estate industry, the environment, and community. Some of the issues we focused on this year include property tax reform, generational wealth through home ownership opportunities, funding our deteriorating transportation infrastructure, attracting businesses to Connecticut and streamlining the process, and of course the conveyance taxes. On October 2nd, after the recently concluded special session of the Connecticut General Assembly, the governor signed House Bill number 7001 an act revising provisions of the Transfer Act and authorizing the development and implementation of a release-based remediation program. Connecticut is one of only two states where environmental investigation and remediation are statutorily triggered by the sale or other transfer of property or operations that meet the definition of an establishment under the Transfer Act. The signing of this bill is great news for our commercial practitioners and many thanks go to Jim Heckman, CTR's Government Affairs Director, who has been working on this for several years. As this year's legislative session was impacted by the pandemic, I expect that it will be a very busy legislative session next year. I look forward to working for you and with you in 2021. Thank you. Carol, and uh, a lot of great information, and thank you for all the hard work you do. And next year's uh, president, it's of CTR, it's gonna be great for you. At this time, I'd like to ask NAR, political analyst and uh, re our region representative, uh, Kristen Hoistad, to give us an update and uh, let us know a little bit about what's happening at the federal level. Uh, Greg, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, Christian Hoistad here. I am 
uh, part of NAR's uh, political advocacy team here in Washington, DC. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen real quick. And uh, let's go ahead and get this started here. All right, just thumbs up from folks if you can see my see my screen. <laughs> All right, awesome. Um, so uh, we are, as of today, 20 days out from election day, which means politics are hot here in Washington and all over the country. Um, we've got uh, Supreme Court hearings today. Uh, we've got dueling presidential town halls tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night. Uh, nearly 10 million people have already cast their ballots across the country. Um, according to NAR's uh, uh, tabulations, um, over 400,000 realtors across the country have already requested their absentee ballots. Um, so I'll certainly take this as an opportunity to uh, remind all of you to, to be sure to, to make a plan to vote and to talk with your friends and family and make sure that they have plans to vote. Um, as you all probably are aware in Connecticut, uh, uh, you no longer need an excuse to, to vote absentee or, or vote by mail. Um, and so applications had gone out in September. Um, if you had already applied, uh, ballots should have started going out the first week of October. So uh, voting is happening and we encourage everybody to stay engaged and, uh, and get out the vote here between now and the general election on November 3rd. So. Um, first, uh, I'll, I'll just uh, real briefly about myself. Um, so I work on a team of six political directors uh, or political representatives um, who cover uh, the, the country here. And so uh, my areas include the six New England states as well as California, Hawaii, and Guam over on the West Coast. Uh, I'm a New England native, originally born and raised in Gloucester, Massachusetts on Boston's North Shore and have worked in, uh, on political campaigns uh, throughout, uh, throughout New England. Um, and for uh, both nonprofits and, and uh, government ent entities here in Washington. So um, as your New England political representative, I serve as the primary liaison from NAR to state and local associations to not only provide updates on what we're up to at the federal level here in Washington, um, but I also manage all of NAR's uh, uh, Realtor Political uh, Action Committee or RPAC activity across the country and manage any of our programs that we're putting in place to elect uh, pro realtor and, and pro real estate uh, candidates uh, to office at the federal level. So um, today I'm going to talk about um, NAR's uh, coronavirus legislative response then and now, um, sort of where we've been in terms of, uh, you know, how things have unfolded since the start of the pandemic back in March and kind of where we are now, and then a quick look at, at kind of where we're going. So. Um, first and foremost, as uh, you probably uh, have heard <laughs> uh, and, and are most aware of in terms of legislation, the big piece of legislation that was most impactful for Realtors um, at the beginning of this, of this pandemic was the CARES Act. Um, prior to the CARES Act being passed in, in March, though, I will say that um, as soon as uh, the, the nation and, and state governments uh, began to, to shut down businesses, um, NAR made an active effort to ensure that real estate was deemed an essential service so that all of you could continue um, with your businesses. And so um, at, at, at first attempt, uh, NAR wasn't able to uh, get real estate included as an essential service um, at the federal level. Um, however, we worked with our state uh, associations across the country to work with their respective governors to make sure that real estate was deemed essential, at least at the state level. Um, and, and Connecticut did a great job, uh, your, your state association on that. Um, essentially, if, if uh, governors wanted people to stay home and shelter in place, our argument was that they needed a home to stay in and, and a, a place to shelter in. And so um, that was certainly a, an effective argument um, across the country. And you know, within two, two weeks of uh, the national emergency being declared, uh, real estate uh, was in fact uh, deemed an essential service by the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and so that was, that was NAR's number one priority just out of the gate. Then came the legislative response and, and uh, the biggest piece of legislation um, that most people are aware of is the CARES Act. That was the $2.2 trillion piece of legislation that was, pa that was passed in uh, March in a bipartisan fashion, the largest piece of legislation ever passed um, by the United States Congress. This was the legislation that included the stimulus checks, that included forgivable small business loans um, that uh, realtors were made eligible for. Um, I will tell you that it was due to NAR's advocacy that 
Um, independent contractors were made eligible for the, the Paycheck Protection Program loans, as well as the Economic Injury Disaster Loan or EIDL loan advances um, out of the gate. Um, and for the first time ever, uh, realtors were uh, made eligible for uh, pandemic unemployment assistance, so for unemployment benefits um, as part of the CARES Act. And so essentially, in addition to just making sure that you all could continue your businesses in however tailored fashion um, as needed to adhere to safety standards, we also wanted to make sure that that financial relief um, was available for folks who needed it. And so we were able to secure that through stimulus checks, not just W-2 employees, but we made sure that 1099 uh, tax filers were also included among those who received stimulus checks. And again, uh, working to make sure that, that realtors were eligible for both the PPP loans as well as the pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, within the CARES Act itself, we saw a lot of changes um, it, to the housing industry overall, including um, extended forbearance, obviously the ev eviction of foreclosure moratoriums, and then loan processing modifications such as desktop appraisals, for example. And NAR worked very closely with the FHFA, Fannie and Freddie, uh, to make sure that um, that loan processing um, could continue in the midst of, of these shutdowns. And then one other point I'll just mention too is uh, the, the extension of the tax deadline. Um, as you know, the tax deadline was extended uh, for regular filers until um, uh, until July, and NAR uh, worked to, uh, with the Treasury Department to make sure that um, those deadlines were extended uh, for uh, quarterly filers, which includes many of our realtor members across the country. And so, um, you know, I just want to reemphasize that working together at the national, the state, and the local level, um, you know, the, the realtor community was able to, to push for these types of of um, federal relief options to make sure um, that all of our members across the country and their families were able to stay afloat during the, the early months of the, of the pandemic. So now where are we? Um, you know, I, I, I should let folks know that um, some of the provisions included in the CARES Act have lapsed. So um, the, the PPP forgivable loans and the EIDL forgivable advances, um, those programs lapsed in early August, um, as well as the enhanced unemployment benefits uh, through the uh, through the PUA uh, unemployment program, um, which uh, I believe those benefits lapsed in July. Um, and then as you all are probably aware, President Trump and the CDC issued an executive order on September 1st, um, enacting or extending the federal eviction moratorium through December uh, 31st. So um, those are obviously all provisions that have benefited realtors and our members. And those are top priorities um, for us here uh, among our advocacy team in DC to make sure that realtors still have options um, for, for relief uh, if they need it. And so of course, those all fit into the larger picture um, of coronavirus relief negotiations, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but first, um, I, I do just kind of want to focus in on this extension of the eviction moratorium. Um, in Connecticut, Governor Lamont um, has uh, similarly issued a state eviction moratorium that matches uh, the, the CDC's uh, executive order um, that extends uh, the, the moratorium through December 31st. And obviously from our perspective, this um, is an incredible hardship um, it, it, in terms of the burden being placed on mom and pop landlords and housing providers uh, without any type of assistance for them. And so we certainly don't want um, you know, we, we certainly support the, the extension of the, of the eviction moratorium as long as there's, uh, there's uh, funding and relief and assistance provided to the housing providers who still have to pay their own mortgages um, on their properties. And so uh, the federal eviction moratorium itself uh, is, it, it, the, the time frame is, was September 4th through December 31st, uh, virtually covers all rental units and renters. Um, and why do realtors care about this? 25%, a quarter of our membership own or manage rental properties. 46% of all rental units are owned by mom and pops and another 37% are owned by LLCs. We're not talking about big corporate landlords here. We're talking about everyday people and everyday, everyday realtors. And so that's why for us, this is a, this is a big problem. And as you know, uh, the eviction moratorium, it doesn't forgive rent, it just, pushes the, the deadline by which that rent needs to be, be paid until January 2021. And so, you know, there is a, a great concern among our industry um, that an eviction crisis is looming and, uh, and we could have some major problems here in January. And so what is our solution to this? 
first and foremost, uh, as soon as, as the order was given back in, in September, um, we sent a, one of the fastest letters I've ever seen come out of our office here in DC, a letter to Congress uh, demanding that they pass emergency rental assistance uh, to, uh, for, uh, as part of the, the federal eviction moratorium, but it should be paid directly to housing providers to make sure that they have uh, the funding necessary to, to you know, pay their own mortgages. Um, we sent letters uh, to congressional leaders up on Capitol Hill. Um, uh, we uh, joined in with a real estate industry coalition um, to send additional uh, industry letters to the Hill. Um, we ran coalition ads in DC publications to make sure that, that uh, the congressional staff were also aware of, of you know, our priorities here in terms of getting emergency um, assistance to uh, housing providers. And we, uh, NAR also put out a grassroots call for action in which uh, we asked our uh, federal uh, political coordinators um, or our uh, realtor liaisons that um, we've designated uh, for each member of Congress to reach out to those congressional offices to, to make sure they were aware um, of, of you know, the, the issue at hand, the, the potential looming crisis, and, and make sure that uh, the passage of emergency rental assistance was, uh, was on their radar. And I know uh, Congressman Courtney um, certainly is aware of it, uh, and uh, would also like to thank uh, Rachel, uh, the Congressman's FEC, who took part in that call for action. And so, um, you know, what was the result of that? Um, we certainly um, were able to get the, the conversation of rental assistance um, into the public discourse, and it is part of the ongoing negotiations, which I'm sure um, the Congressman will be able to, to touch on um, during, during his uh, portion of uh, this presentation. But, um, you know, where, where exactly now do we stand in terms of both COVID negotiations as well as rental assistance? Because they're, they're kind of one in the same at this point. So back in, uh, back in the spring, uh, the House passed their own version um, of, of COVID relief. It was a, a $3 trillion uh, bill uh, that included basically an extension of all the existing programs um, uh, in their bill, but it also provided for $100 billion in rental assistance, which NAR liked. Um, and it also provided for state and local aid. The Senate then passed their own kind of scaled down version of a, of a relief bill in July, which was the HEALS Act, uh, which was uh, a trillion, one trillion dollars versus three trillion passed by the Democrats. And it provided for a bit of scaled back um, uh, relief, in, including uh, you know, $200 in enhanced uh, unemployment benefits through the PUA program versus the full 600. Um, also had an emphasis on business liability protection, um, also extended the, the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and uh, I will say both bills provided for second rounds of stimulus checks. However, the Senate bill did not address uh, rental assistance and did not include state and local aid, which has become a bit of a sticking point. So that kind of takes us from spring into summer as, the, as Congress was, prepare, was preparing to recess. Negotiations didn't seem to be um, <laughs> going all that well. And so there's a caucus in Congress called the Problem Solvers Caucus. And they, provided, uh, they, they proposed a compromise, which basically kind of was the, the medium point between uh, the, the Senate and the House bills. Their bill that they provo uh, proposed was one, $1.5 trillion, um, cut PUA down to $450 for eight weeks, also provided for second rounds of PPP and EIDL advanced loans, um, second rounds of stimulus checks, um, rental assistance uh, in, in the form of $25 billion versus that of the HEROES Act in the House, which had $100 billion, um, and then also included state and local aid to make sure that the Democrats would be attuned um, to the, the bill itself. Um, Unfortunately, uh, that that bill itself uh, uh, did not gain traction um, in in <laughs> either chamber, um, and so as uh, Speaker Pelosi and Treasury Secretary uh, Mnuchin uh, continued their negotiations, um, the House did move forward in in passing a further scaled down version um, of a relief bill called. Heroes Act 2.0. And so this is about a, a $2 trillion bill. It would extend the pandemic unemployment assistance, uh, the $600 a week through January 31st, would provide a second round of PPP loans um, with some, uh, some criteria in terms of businesses with uh, 200 employees or, or less, as well as um, the, uh, having to prove a 25% loss of revenue. Um, and so that program would be extended through December 31st. 
Uh, their bill, again, continues to provide for a second round of stimulus checks, uh, increases the, the rental assistance from the problem solvers uh, proposal of 25 billion to 50 billion, but is still 50 billion less than their initial proposal of 100 billion. Um, and then uh, they again uh, push for state and local aid. So while these negotiations were occurring, uh, President Trump then tweeted out that he wanted to end negotiations um, until, uh, until after the election. And so the negotiations came to a bit of a halt. Um, following that tweet, the market started to take a little bit of a tumble and then the president retweeted uh, or went back on Twitter and said that he actually would be open um, to additional uh, coronavirus relief before the election in the form of either stimulus checks um, and potentially a, a PVP loans. So, um, so at, where do things stand at this point? Essentially, uh, the, we're, we're at a standstill um, in, in terms of those negotiations. Perhaps uh, Congressman Corney has a, a bit more to, to share beyond that. Um, uh, we just heard yesterday that the Senate is looking to propose um, a bill that would extend uh, the PVP program uh, just as a, as a standalone item um, through the end of the year. However, uh, Speaker Pelosi has said that, uh, that she's not going to entertain standalone pieces, that she wants a comprehensive bill um, to make sure the economy stays afloat. So again, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're still at a, a bit of a standstill here. Um, and uh, we, we, on our end here at, at NAR, aren't too optimistic about a, a relief bill passing um, before the election. So, so that's kind of where things are at in, in terms of um, coronavirus uh, uh, relief. I will say yesterday, the president did tweet out um, yesterday morning, uh, go big or go home on stimulus relief. So who knows, maybe, maybe he will direct Treasury Secretary Mnuchin um, to go back into negotiations with the speaker. But um, again, we, we aren't too optimistic about it. So what else are we focusing on from a federal perspective? Um, I will say that the government has been doing some things, which is, which is always good. Uh, the government would have run out of uh, funding on September, 30, uh, September 30th, so they uh, passed a, a government funding bill known as a continuing resolution that funds the government through December uh, 11th. And as part of that uh, government funding bill, we were able to include a uh, extension, a full one-year extension of the National Flood Insurance Program uh, through next September. Uh, that is a, a huge victory for, for realtors to, to bring stability um, to, that, to that market. And you know, for, this is the second year in a row that we've been able to, to get this included as part of a funding bill. So that was a, a very positive sign. Um, as part of the uh, government funding bill as well, there was uh, surface transportation funding included. Um, in that bill, which again is, is critical in terms of support for infrastructure needs across the country. So again, uh, we consider that a, 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 a good victory for, for our membership, especially um, those on the commercial side of things. Um, and then uh, one last thing I did just wanna mention before I wrap up is uh, the Small Business Administration um, did release a simplified PPP forgiveness application um, last, at the end of last week. Um, so this basically takes, uh, for, for those who did receive a PPP loan who uh, are looking to, to seek that forgiveness now, it's, uh, it's cut the, uh, the application from three pages to a page and a half. Um, and, all, and essentially you have to submit your documentation through your lender to confirm your payroll costs, employee numbers, et cetera, um, to, to obtain that forgiveness. So uh, NAR, I will tell you, is advocating to, to basically just provide for automatic uh, forgiveness uh, for anyone with a PPP loan under $150,000. This application that was released, um, uh, borrowers with a loan of 50,000 or less are able to take advantage of the simplified uh, application, um, but NAR will continue to push to see that all uh, loans under $150,000 uh, would be automatically forgiven. And so where that, that's uh, a priority for us um, going forward as, as uh, COVID relief negotiations um, continue, um, likely pass the election uh, potentially into the, this lame duck sec uh, session of Congress um, post-election uh, prior to uh, the swearing in either of President Trump or um, if, uh, if uh, Joe Biden were to win. So um, that's where things stand in Washington. Um, uh, please, if, if you have any questions about NAR's response to the coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic, you can visit our microsite, nar.realtor slash coronavirus. It has guidance, FAQs, legislative summaries, infographics, instructions on how to 
uh, apply for PPP forgiveness, instructional videos, et cetera. Just a really great resource, NAR is put together. Um, that's my contact information on the right-hand side. Um, I consider myself uh, a concierge to all of you from NAR. So if you have questions about policy, politics, or, or anything else uh, regarding uh, the industry uh, where NAR comes into play, please don't hesitate to reach out to me by email or on my cell. I'll put it in the chat so folks have it. And uh, that's it for me today. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Christian. And I've got to point out in spotlight, if that uh, information that was just shared does not justify the $150 NARS dues, I don't know what can. That is a lot of great information you just shared with us. And with that, I will now uh, turn to uh, and call Rachel Johnston um, to speak here. And she is going to introduce our Congressman Joe Courtney, uh, who will provide us with a, a legislative update. Rachel, I want to spotlight, serves <laughs> as a federal political coordinator for NAR. So Rachel. Thank you, Greg. And good morning, everyone. Um, Congressman Joe Courtney was elected in 2006 to represent the second congressional district of Connecticut, which includes New London, Tolland, and Wyndham counties, as well as portions of Hartford, Middlesex, and New Haven counties. He serves on the Armed Services and Education Labor Committees. Joe is also the chairman of the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Sea Power and Projection Forces, the first known member from Connecticut to lead a naval oversight panel in the House of Representatives since 1873. Joe's a graduate of Tufts University and earned his law degree from the University of Connecticut. After graduating from law school, he worked as a public defender and then later became a partner in the law firm of Courtney, Boyan, and Ferran. He also served four terms in the Connecticut House of Representatives and was honored by Connecticut Magazine for his bipartisan efforts in the State House. Joe has been a tireless advocate for the homeowners we represent. As an attorney who handled many, many closings in his career, Joe gets it when we talk to him about why it's so important to continue to reauthorize the flood insurance program, the severity of the crumbling foundations crisis, why any tax reforms that Congress may address must not dilute tax provisions that are so vital to the housing market. Joe also has recognized the difficulties that first time home buyers who are saddled with the excessive student loan debt have in obtaining mortgages. It's truly a pleasure for me to serve as your liaison to our member of Congress, and I am really honored for me today to introduce to you our Congressman Joe Courtney. Congressman Courtney. Great, thank you, uh, Rachel, and good morning, everyone. Um, again, we uh, spent a lot of time together in Washington over the years, and uh, it's very frustrating to have to do this virtually, but uh, again, I, I know um, Carol and Susie, have done really an outstanding job during the pandemic uh, using uh, any platform possible to make sure that good information uh, is getting out there. And uh, I want to really tip my hat to, to Christian. Um, you know, he was being far too modest in terms of, uh, you know, really the impact that the National Association of Realtors had, particularly on the continuing resolution, the government funding measure that he talked about um, at the end. And, and I might, again, rather than just rehashing it, because it really, that was a really nice um, summary that he put together of, you know, events since March up to the present. But uh, I, th I thought it maybe I'd sort of go in reverse order a little bit in terms of, you know, his, his uh, update. The continuing resolution, which again, was signed into law by President Trump on September 30th, uh, again, is a, a measure to keep the lights on, uh, avoid a shutdown, which would be, you know, even more of a, um, you know, tragedy in the middle of what we're all sort of going through here. Um, you know, generally speaking, the leadership um, are adamant that they want to keep those CRs, as they're called, clean um, and not have any um, policy items or um, funding changes because it's really just an extension of last year's funding level. And as I said, tr keeping it clean is a way of trying to keep it um, more, you know, sustainable politically. For the National Association of Realtors to get that flood insurance uh, provision in there, that is really good work. And I, and I just, you know, I, from my perspective, I, I feel very strongly that people should understand that, that um, that is not easy, um, getting a measure like that um, into, a, into a CR. So, you know, really bravo um, to, and, and again, it's because of your grassroots organic approach in terms of having members call 
senators and, and, and House members that that actually um, materializes and happens. You know, I would also note that were, we were successful with a couple of other um, anomalies, as they're called, on the CR uh, that are very locally uh, relevant to this area. Yesterday, uh, I was with the, the governor uh, up at a hemp uh, uh, processing plant up in Suffield, Connecticut. Again, the CR extended the USDA hemp uh, program that uh, now farmers in Connecticut are able to plant uh, industrial hemp. There's about 500 acres last summer. If that did not uh, get done in the CR, um, they basically would have had product that would have been stranded and really just gone to waste. And um, uh, and lastly, the really big one, particularly for southeastern Connecticut, is that we got a $1.8 billion anomaly uh, for the Columbia Submarine Program in the in the continuing resolution. Um, as, as I think many of you know, this is the new class of submarines that, um, again, are on the verge of production right now. Uh, my subcommittee authorized a two-year uh, contracting process for Columbia. If you look at Groton, there's probably about 12 construction cranes uh, in the South Yard where, uh, again, they're preparing to take the modular units from, from uh, Rhode Island. And again, getting that $1.8 billion um, add additional funding for Columbia means that the production process, which again is going to start this year, uh, primarily at Quonset Point in Rhode Island, that's where they'll build the modular units, and then they're going to barge it up uh, the, the Thames River to the, to the new building that I said is, is under construction. That's probably one of the biggest construction projects in the entire state of Connecticut. It's roughly about $700 million uh, building that's going up there. So uh, again, not getting that money into the CR would have really uh, pretty much um, shut down the process uh, and we don't need that kind of instability with, uh, again, one of the really uh, large growth areas um, in, in the district. The, um, you know, in terms of uh, where the HEROES Act stands right now, uh, yesterday actually we had a caucus conference call and, um, you know, we uh, actually got an update in terms of uh, negotiations. There, are, there is still communication going on, Christian, between uh, Secretary Mnuchin and the Speaker's office. Um, and, uh, but I, I really appreciate the fact that you did sort of put the spotlight on the rental assistance priority that the National Association of Realtors, because frankly, that's one of the items that is sort of still stuck in terms of getting agreement. And um, as every realtor knows, you know, a, an eviction moratorium really begs the question of, well, who pays? And right now it is the landlords that are paying big time. Uh, Governor Lamont, to his credit, when he signed his order, um, did allocate some funding from CARES Act that the state of Connecticut still had in its possession, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, to provide some payments um, to, to landlords. Uh, but again, as, as uh, Christian said, you know, the funding levels from, from the CARES Act is really starting to run dry. And that's true also of Connecticut's allotment from the Coronavirus Relief Fund. And uh, this morning, Moody's Analytics actually did a, released a report in terms of what is the accumulated unpaid back rent in this country right now between now and the end of the year. And the number is $75 billion uh, across the country. So, you know, it, we've got to address this problem, you know, in terms of, um, you know, making sure that, that landlords, many of whom are small time, you know, small unit um, uh, landlords are, are, you know, given some uh, protection and not and don't end up being the bill payer uh, of $75 billion um, in terms of unpaid uh, rent. And frankly, I think we also have to reflect on the fact that, again, the, the, ev the eviction moratorium stops on December 31st. That is the middle of the winter. And if anybody thinks that the pandemic, I mean, I, you know, again, the one thing I will say very strongly in favor of President Trump's uh, coronavirus relief um, response is that Operation Warp Speed, which is, uh, again, using the Department of Defense to set up infrastructure to distribute vaccines, you know, once we get through FDA approval, uh, again, that's really making sure that we're going to have the capacity to move this stuff out at warp speed. That's, a, that's really good stuff, and it's really, uh, it's proceeding um, well. And General Milley uh, briefs the Armed Services Committee on that, on that operation. But the bottom line is, you're still not gonna have uh, a vaccine distribution system that is capable of getting um, distribution under the best of circumstances until at least late spring, early summer. So this issue of eviction moratorium in a pandemic is not gonna come to an end on December 31st. And that's why this has to be a, a true priority of a, of a relief package. And, and again, I, I give uh, NAR tremendous credit for, for really uh, elevating the, the importance of this issue. And, um, 
you know, given the fact that we got four COVID relief bills done and uh, the, the president did say, go big or go home, I couldn't agree with him more. Uh, and, and frankly, if you listen to Jerome Powell, who's the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, who is the guy who's keeping interest rates at, you know, dirt cheap, low levels, and that's helping all of you sell houses uh, out there right now, and, that, and those rates are going to stay in place for the next two years. He is begging Congress, and, and he has said that the biggest danger is undershooting, not overshooting, in terms of a, of a relief package. And, and I, you know, hopefully, you know, all of that will sort of come together uh, in, the, in the coming days. I am on 24 hours notice to get back down to Washington. I, I would get down there in, you know, <laughs> an hour's notice because it's a 50, hour, 50 minute flight. But, um, you know, we, it's critical that we get this done. And again, NAR has really done a great job in terms of, um, you know, trying to keep that sort of um, priority uh, uppermost in people's minds, even 20 days before an election. Um, you know, we, we had um, activity during the uh, crash in 2008, right before the election. So this is not unprecedented for Congress to take up uh, an, a measure uh, like this. The, um, the CARES Act, which uh, again was, uh, again, a, a massive bill um, that passed, uh, H.R. 748, which was actually one of, it was a bill I introduced, uh, is the CARES Act. It was uh, stripped in the Senate because we, we actually took care of the, that issue. It was the excise tax on health plans somewhere else. So I will go down in history as the sponsor of the CARES Act. If you look it up in the congressional record, uh, it's true. Uh, but again, that, that the content of that bill was negotiated, and I don't take any credit for that. But we're still seeing the benefits of the CARES Act um, play out, uh, even locally here. Um, a couple of days ago, we, uh, I was with the dairy farmers who got a second tranche of CARES Act funding uh, to help with their price supports. Um, and again, they took a huge hit uh, back in the spring in terms of the price of milk and, and you know, related dairy products. Uh, that was there. The uh, HUD uh, regional office came down to uh, the district a, a few weeks ago, and we visited with the Norwich and New London uh, mayors because there, there was CARES Act CDBG money, which uh, again is going to help hopefully with a utility bill arrears that's also piling up along with rent uh, out there, uh, which again is all about trying to keep people in their homes uh, right now. And we also visited up in Vernon um, with uh, Mayor Champagne to talk about, again, HUD programs for crumbling foundations, which, you know, we've talked about uh, in terms of a lot of the visits uh, here uh, in the office. So, um, you know, again, uh, COVID relief, uh, and it's right from the Federal Reserve Board Chairman's mouth, is something that is really critical in terms of shortening the recession um, and keeping um, you know people uh, safe and healthy, which is fundamentally key to to really uh, you know getting this uh, our economy back on track. You know, to all the realtors that are on here, I mean, I, I saw the the home sales numbers uh, for Connecticut, which uh, you know it's really interesting how some sectors are kind of you know doing better than others. Uh, a good friend of mine is a real estate developer who owns a lot of movie theaters. He's not doing very well right now for obvious reasons, but home sales seem to be really um, chugging along. And, um, and again, I know it's because of the hard work of realtors um, who I've dealt with both professionally and, and certainly in Congress in terms of uh, keeping, you know, that activity uh, going along. So I cannot stay for the candidate uh, portion this morning. I've got a, another uh, stop I, I got to uh, get off to. I want to, first of all, just say hello to Lieutenant Colonel Anderson, who uh, is running. And, um, you know, uh, again, we've had a number of uh, really civil um, events together. And I certainly know that people in, in Eastern Connecticut really uh, appreciate that. Um, my office is still uh, open and functioning, though. And in terms of uh, HEROES Act updates, um, and COVID negotiation updates, any CARES Act, um, you know, news that we have out there. Uh, you know, again, we, we have a completely, um, you know, real-time communication uh, with uh, Susie, uh, Rachel, Carol, you know, a lot of my uh, friends out there, and certainly with Christian and his team. And, and um, you know, I, I want to just sort of say as, as stressful and, and hard as this time is for everyone, um, political engagement is just, you know, <laughs> you have to do it and, and, and realtors have to do it. You're, you're a key economic engine for our country, but also you're a very sort of regulated um, you know, sector. And that's why um, you know, the interaction between both federal and state law, lawmakers is, is really, um, you know, it's just, it's essential to, to you guys achieving success in, in what you do. And uh, thank, again, I wanna just thank you all for the invitation to be here. And again, if people have follow-up questions, Megan O'Sullivan, 
is the person who's sort of quarterbacking in my office, um, you know, questions regarding to realtor issues. And certainly um, Susie can d direct you to, uh, to Megan if there's any follow-up this morning. So stay safe and well. And uh, again, it's great to see all your faces on the Zoom checkerboard. Thank, thank you, Joe. Yeah. And, and right. you, one of your closing uh, points about uh, you know, getting, you know, politics and getting involved in it, it's an, one, you know, a lot of us don't have the antenna and the uh, uh, aptitude for politics, but one thing we each do have is the aptitude to understand issues. So if you want to drop the word politics and just say it's issues, <laughs> we're working on that. So also in chat, everybody, um, I have Joe Courtney's newsletter subscription. It is awesome because it, it takes everything that you read in the headlines and distills it down to Joe's read on what is happening here in Eastern Connecticut and how are these issues affecting each of us. So definitely uh, subscribe. I love when I get it because I can just run through it. It's structured well. Megan, I think you have something to do with that. So uh, hats off to both of you and thank you so much for your time today. Great. All right. Take care, everybody. Yeah. So right now I'd like to bring up eCars president-elect. Uh, Bonnie Nault, and she is going to moderate the Meet the Candidates Q&A. That's going to be for the next 30 to 40 minutes. So, Bonnie. Thank you so much, Greg, and thank you to all the um, uh, sitting uh, elected officials and candidates for being here. As we go down the list of candidates in attendance by district, with the exception of our first guest, um, we would like you to introduce yourself, tell us which town and office you're running for and why it should matter to our members. Each candidate has two minutes and we do have a timer, Susie's keeping track. I apologize in advance if we have to cut you off. Members are gonna put questions in the chat and they will be re raised at the end. So we won't take questions during the thing. So first is a uh, congressional candidate, Justin Anderson, and um, you have two minutes. Hi, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Justin Anderson, running for Congress. Um, I live in East Haddam, Connecticut. Uh, I did move here, you know, probably within the last five years. So I'm, I'm a fairly new, new homeowner myself. And the, uh, you know, the industry is doing very well. You know, it, uh, I, I like, I would like to point out real quickly that uh, you know, Joe, Joe Courtney, fantastic guy. The reason why things are so civil is because I do have a lot of respect for him and I have a lot of respect for what he's been doing at the local levels. I think most of my issues and why I'm getting into politics are more at the national level. And, uh, you know, at this point, it's not even worth getting into it because those are, those are bigger and broader and, uh, you know, not really you know, worthy of this, uh, this platform right here. So realistically, the, 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 NR, the NAR, uh, you know, looking at what you've done, uh, I had no idea that you were doing, you know, quite that much. And the, uh, the renter's assistant is, is, is probably, that's something that's been on my mind for quite some time because I know a lot of people who do rent. And so that's something that's, that's, that's huge. Uh, I didn't know that you had progressed as far as, far as negotiations um, you know, within Congress. That's something I would absolutely back up. Uh, I would like to point out that I, I do consider also like the Chromeling Foundation's, you know, part of the whole you know, realtors industry because one thing we have to look at here in the state of Connecticut is, is, is not just trying to bring jet back jobs. Uh, unfortunately, I think as a state, although uh, in, in the current administration prior to COVID-19, I think, uh, you know, economically that the country has been doing very well. Connecticut hasn't been. We've actually been losing industry and prior to COVID-19, we actually had a lot of people that were moving out. So it was, it's, it's been very unfortunate as far as the, the manufacturing, the, the, the industry, and just the economy, you know, as a whole here in Connecticut. And one thing that I'd like to tie together is when, when you're looking at the economy, you know, as we figure out, you know, better ways to try and boost our economy, uh, you know, get it back in gear and, you know, also support like, you know, electric boat and, and, and definitely the, the government contracting, which luckily we have here in the state of Connecticut, because that kind of helps, you know, sustain a, you know, certain tax base here. It's very, very important. But we have to look at as we're trying to pull people into Connecticut. Okay. I mean, we have to have places for them to move into. Crumbling Foundations is absolutely a part of that. You know, you can't invite people into Connecticut and not have, you know, a, you know, a good home situation or good homes for them to move into. We can't be, you know, scraping to find these, these, uh, these, these homes. And, and, and also, I, I know the industry is doing fairly well right now. It, it does seem like a lot of people are trying to get out of like New York City. And I know there's certain areas that are going to be doing well because it's just too costly to be in other areas. But really what we need to do, and I think this is an ad advantage for all of us, is if we can get industry and business back into Connecticut and boost our economy, we want people that are coming into Connecticut that not just live here, you know, but work here. 
So that, that's something we have to tie in together. And another thing we have to look at also when we look at electric boat is, you know, certainly a pipeline to get people, you know, doing technical jobs, you know, sheet metal, electronics, so that we don't run out of time. Oh, I just ran out of time. <laughs> um, if, if that was it, you know, thank, thank you. Uh, you know, I look forward to any questions uh, later on. Appreciate thank it. Thank you so much. Next up is my own personal senator, State Senator uh, Heather Summers. Am I unmuted? You're unmuted. I am? Okay. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for uh, putting together this forum. Um, I represent um, the 18th District, which is Groton, Sterling, Plainfield, Preston, Stonington, North Stonington, and Groton. And I want to first thank you for your endorsement. Um, I have always enjoyed working with the realtors, um, the conveyance taxes, the Transfer Act, reducing property taxes. Those are all things that I have been advocating for for quite some time. As a former mayor, I completely understand the punitive nature of our property tax and its um, effect on not only home sales, but the people that are trying to stay in those homes on a retired income. Um, I did have some questions for you. I was curious as to how you are um, seeing the influx of new home ownership from New York and what kind of reaction are you getting when they see what people are paying in property tax here in Connecticut. One of the things that I've heard from my local realtors, not from Bonnie, so I don't want to put her on the spot, is that you know they're, they're looking and they can sell the home, but when people see what they're paying in property tax, there's like sticker shock. And that has made people sort of rethink, do they want to buy that more expensive home or um, perhaps choose something else? So I would like to um, talk about that later on today. Um, one of the most important things for me is um, maintaining the ability for our constituents to be able to afford a home, to have home ownership be within reach. I believe that the way that we do that is to provide the landscape here for businesses to thrive and to be able to be successful and to make sure that we are embracing our employers that we have here, talking to them, finding out what it is, what their needs are so that we can help them be successful. Um, the legislature unfortunately has a history of being very punitive towards business owners, which we've seen now with, um, besides COVID, before COVID, very high unemployment rate here in Connecticut. And that has to change for us to be successful. And home ownership is part of that, of that continuum. Um, I am very concerned about the uh, rental moratorium coming to an end, and I have heard overwhelmingly, like I'm sure many of you have, on landlords that are stretched to the point of being on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, so that is something that absolutely has to be addressed, and it has to come from the federal level. Um, yeah, I was glad to hear. Uh, Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Okay, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, candidate uh, Bob Statchen for the Sen oh. Senate District 18. Sure. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this meeting. I think it's it's obviously very important and very crucial. Um, this industry, its impact on Eastern Connecticut as well as as well as all of Connecticut. Um, and I've I've actually I you know I think my point is that I've I've worked with with several of you when I was at Tobin Carberry um, for ten years doing commercial and and residential closings. Um, I did leave there and ended up going to. Uh, Western New England Law School. And for the past five years there, I've run a real estate practicum. And what I do in that practicum is I place students in law firms that are that do closings, do, do real estate closings, and I place, uh, and they, I also place them in, with title companies. So I'm kind of training the next round of, of lawyers that are going to assist you to make sure we get to closing and we get through closings. Um, and I think that, you know, and we also have a seminar and as part of that seminar, I invite realtors in um, because I think it's important that my students, we also invite bankers in, but I think it's important for uh, the students to recognize that, that these closings are part of a team. And, and sometimes some lawyers may feel like they're the center of the universe. I don't know if, if any of you have ever dealt with that. But what we try to work for is that we ask the realtors, what's the best thing that attorneys do for you? And what's the most annoying thing um, that attorneys do? And get them ready because the work you do is crucial. The importance that you have on our local economy and our society in so many things is so crucial. And that's why I take it, I, for the past, again, five years running this, very important for my students both to know how important the work is that you are and that they're part of the team and hopefully 
I'll end up being part of the team with you here and understanding the issues and being able to represent your interests uh, in Hartford. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is out of uh, uh, District 19, Senator Kathy Austin. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Kathy Austin, and I uh, represent the 19th District. I want to thank you for your endorsement. Um, I think it's uh, one of the most important things that, uh, that we have for small businesses is realtors and the work that they do in our respective communities. Um, I represent 10 towns in Eastern Connecticut, Marlboro, Hebron, Lebanon, Columbia, Sprague, Franklin, Norwich, Lisbon, Ledger, and part of Monville. Uh, I have worked um, uh, diligently in the legislature to uh, deal with the issues of the business climate and uh, the general climate in Eastern Connecticut. Uh, I think that there's a lot of things that we're working on. Um, I heard a couple of comments on uh, manufacturers leaving the area. Quite frankly, manufacturers are coming into the area. Uh, I sponsored a bill in the General Assembly, which uh, uh, helped support Excuse the manufacturing me. I, pipeline. I interrupt you. Could whoever's not muted please mute themselves? Sorry, Kathy. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, I just wanted to let you know that uh, there's $50 million that's been put aside for job training in the bonding. We've uh, used that before that. There was uh, $5 million. The Eastern Manufacturing Pipeline is not only important in Connecticut, it's, got, it's taken off nationally. Uh, it provides us uh, an opportunity to retrain people into uh, the uh, manufacturing jobs that are uh, becoming available um, in Connecticut. In addition, it also uh, has taken off in our high schools to provide students to go directly from school onto the shop room floors. Uh, with uh, jobs that provide more than a living wage uh, between fifty and sixty thousand dollars, I think that that's the um, that was the bell, and uh, I look forward to listening to what everybody else has to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, next up is candidate Steve Weir. See here. I'm here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm Steve Weir, candidate for State Senate in the 19th District. I am a lifelong resident of Connecticut. I live in Hebron with my wife and three daughters. Um, I am running because I'm hopeful that my children will have opportunities in Connecticut and will want to stay here. I'm a small business owner of a disaster restoration business. So we perform fire damage, water damage, cleanup, mold, and we've performed uh, property damage cleanup for uh, many realtors over the years. We employ just about just under 50 people, and I take great pride in the service that our employees provide to our customers. Uh, I also believe in service to the community in addition to my, additionally I serve on our local zoning board of appeals. Uh, several years ago, in the early 2000s, I was actually a licensed realtor in Connecticut prior to focusing solely on this business. Uh, so I understand uh, many of the challenges that you all are facing. Over the past 20 years, I've watched my personal property taxes go up. Uh, our property values really have not recovered from the Great Recession, while much of the rest of the country has seen a rebound. So uh, not only in, in property values, but in job growth and development. And I think that uh, many of the laws in Connecticut and the regulations need to provide and foster an environment where they're friendly to the business environment. Uh, I really believe that the government doesn't create jobs, that it's actually small business and businesses that create jobs. So the way that the government can help is to create those conditions that are favorable to business and encourage them to invest and take risks, uh, in which cases those businesses expand, they hire people, and, and so on and so on, adding to the, um, you know, they're able to pay those, pay the taxes. Um, I would also look, if elected, to reduce the cost of government, to pay, help pay down our debt, to bridge the gap of, uh, of our deficit, and to encourage small business to invest in Connecticut. Uh, as an aside, I sit on the board of the Connecticut Apartment Association, which represents about 50,000 units in Connecticut. And the recent federal and state eviction moratoriums were really poorly thought out. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Your time's up. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Okay, next up is um, uh, Senator Paul Formica out of District uh, 20. I see he's here. Is he unmuted? Good morning to you. There you are. Great. Thanks, Paul. Excuse me. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all again. I'm Paul Formica. I'm the current state senator of the 20th district, which includes a portion of Old Saybrook, Old Lyme, East Lyme, Waterford, New London, a portion of Montville, Basra, and Salem. Uh, I'm a former first selectman of the town of East Lyme and finishing my third term, uh, and I'm privileged to say that uh, as the state senator here in the 20th district. Um, I appreciate uh, once again the support uh, from your organization and the realtors as uh, uh, I have tried since I've been there to give you guys a Connecticut to sell and to improve the business climate and I think we've moved uh, in that direction. I serve the Energy and Technology Committee as the ranking member and the Appropriations Committee as the ranking member. The utilities bill, uh, reform bill that just passed unanimously in the Senate mm -hmm. with a few votes uh, in opposition in the House turns the utility model to a performance-based metric where from once the performance standards are designed, the utilities will be held to a standard on performance for rates uh, and the bill mandates improvements in the way they do business, specifically in communication and restoration. We need a lot to work on in energy, and I start with that because energy is a very significant cost to business, uh, and it is a concern for residents when they come here. Uh, the next session of the General Assembly will encompass a wide range of energy initiatives, energy efficiency, transparency on the bill, wholesale markets, uh, regional, um, regional work together and uh, renewables, transmission, generation, all of those things are going to be worked on. And in terms of appropriations. Was that the bell? Huh? It was the bell, yeah. Okay, it's, okay. Hard to, it's very hard to hear that, Susie. Okay. Um, uh, thank, thank you so much, Senator Famica. Up next is out of District 35, okay. Senator Dan Champagne. Thank you so much. I'm Senator Dan Champagne, and I currently uh, uh, am Senator in the 35th District, which encompasses uh, Ashford, Chaplin, Coventry, Eastford, Hampton, Pompert, Tallinn, Union, Wellington, Woodstock, and a portion of Ellington. I want to thank this organization for their endorsement. Uh, the realtors are a very important part of uh, Connecticut. Uh, currently, I am on the Public Safety Committee and the Judicial Committee, I'm a ranking member on planning and development. And that deals with local government. I'm also the mayor of the town of Vernon. And one of, everything that happens in planning and development, I can relate specifically to what will happen to our, our local governments. And I think uh, one of the important things when we think about that is property taxes. Our property taxes are, are, are very high in comparison to the rest of the country. And I'm working very hard to do everything I can to uh, keep those low or lower um, because uh, the, the direction we keep going is, is increasing those. And that's mainly because of the, uh, the debt in the state. One of the other things that I, that I work hard at is uh, not increasing taxes in Connecticut or the uh, debt. So I voted along those lines. And, and I think it's real important that uh, we keep our sights on that. The, uh, in the next session, we have a lot of things that are going to come up that are going to be costly, and I think we really need to pay attention to some of those. And I think it, it, it's going to take a proven leader to, to continue to fight against that. Um, obviously, we're a little outnumbered right now, but, uh, you know, we have tolls coming up, and I think, you know, that's just another tax on the people, uh, and I think that's going to hurt our state. Uh, and, and some of the expenses that have been put in place over the last two years, uh, I think, are going to come back um, and, and hurt us again. We are at least $2 billion short uh, in this coming year. And there's, a, there's talks of the governor going after the rainy day fund. The rainy day fund has basically protected us for um, uh, due to our, uh, our, our bond rating. And the bond rating is important for any of the monies that we do borrow. Um, so I think it's important that we can, oh, I'm sorry. That was the bell. Bill. Thank you so much. Um, next up is uh, Representative um, Holly Cheeseman out of District 37. Good morning. I hope you, I 
think I unmuted. Can you all hear me? Yep. Terrific. Hi, I'm State Representative Holly Cheeseman. I represent the 37th District, which is the two towns of East Lyme and Salem. I am running for my third term. It's been my honor to serve for the past four years. Um, my day job or uh, my other full-time employment, I'm Executive Director of the Niantic Children's Museum. So I am on the ground, both in the legislature and locally, uh, running a small business. As I say, a nonprofit doesn't mean you don't make money. Uh, you need to, you just don't pay it to shareholders. Thank you so much for your endorsement. I think it's critical that we have a state in which people can afford to live and work and buy property. I want to commend Senator Austin. I've been a big supporter of the Eastern Workforce Investment Board to create the skilled workforce we need. We have to continue to produce the workers to do the jobs that are here in Connecticut. We have to have a state in which they can afford to live. We have to end increasing the unfunded mandates on municipalities, whether our boards of ed or whether our towns, those only drive up property taxes. As a legislature, we have to stop treating every business as if they're a large corporation. Too often we pass legislation that assumes everybody has a legal department and a compliance department and an HR department. 80% of our businesses, like you realtors, are small and medium sized. And too often we assume, oh, well, that's all right. Somebody else will handle that. I find it ironic, and maybe I'm the only one, that it's taken a pandemic to make people move back into Connecticut instead of seeing the, it, the outflow. Uh, we were one of 10 states to lose population in 2019. We lost 3,300 jobs. The rainy day fund that Senator Champagne referenced is only there because we had tied in the Senate and close in the House, and we had true bipartisan budget. And I don't know if that, that was the bell. Thank you. And thank you for what you do. And I'm, I've got your back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Next up is um, out of District 38 is Kathleen McCarty. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'd like to begin by thanking the uh, realtors for this invitation today, and thank you for your endorsement. Um, my name is Kathleen McCarty. I represent the 38th District, which is Waterford and a portion of Monville. I am finishing my third term serving on appropriations, education and public health, and I am the ranking member on education. Um, I would like to echo some of the comments made by my colleagues that we certainly have in front of us uh, very complex issues going forward. The pandemic has heightened the uh, need for us to work together in a bipartisan manner to get Connecticut back revitalized. And uh, I think we have to focus on economic growth in the state and creation of new jobs. We're fortunate in southeastern Connecticut. I think we have many opportunities that we can work with. Um, we heard today about EB. We have um, Pfizer close by and we have new projects. We have to keep our jobs here for Millstone. And uh, so we're fortunate in this region that we will have opportunities. But I would like to bring forward today one issue that I think the realtors should uh, be aware of, and that is working with our schools. Last session, I worked very hard to maintain local control of our schools. There was a strong effort to look at regionalization of schools. And while I'd like to say that I'm for definitely for share, sharing services and looking for efficiencies in education, I do believe that we need to be cognizant of our school districts and maintain the local control. This is something that is very dear to our parents and our students. Uh, we want to provide quality education for all of Connecticut students, but I think it's uh, very important that we maintain local control, not only of our schools, also in zoning. <laughs> so thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Out of um, District 39, we have candidate Kat Goulart. Good morning. Thank you all so much. Uh, my name is Kat Goulart. I am uh, hopefully uh, will be representing the 39th district. I am the challenger for that seat. 
Um, so a little bit about me. I am uh, 40 years old. I am originally from Montville. I have been in New London for almost 14 years now. Um, uh, among the many things that I do in New London is uh, I am chairperson of the Police Community Relations Committee and also a commissioner on, uh, for many years, on the Economic Development Commission. And uh, those two things uh, really speak to the heart of what drew me to politics and what drives my advocacy for the city of New London uh, is to keep our city safe and continue to make improvements in the area of public safety and also to grow the economy of New London. Um, I'm, I'm sure you are all very well aware um, that housing is a unique situation in New London. We don't really have any available land there uh, and we have um, a, a tremendously high number of uh, of uh, renters in New London, uh, specifically in my district. So the 39th district is the northern two thirds of New London. Um, and so, you know, when we're when we're speaking of the uh, eviction moratorium, that's something that is is really um, impactful for New London. Um, we have to really balance that because we have a lot of people um, that uh, are are really taking advantage of that right now, and and are really um, they they need to make sure that they stay in their homes. But a lot of people are are necessary that are are uh, owning the homes that are in need of that. Relief there, and so we have to make that make sure that we have that balance there for them. Um, the the property tax rates are something that I've been keeping a very close eye on for years, and that was probably the number one thing that drew me to politics in New London is keeping that mill rate low. We're at almost forty seven for our mill rate in New London. It is very thank very high. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Bonnie, you're muted. Um, and next up out of District 40 is Christine Conley. And I, I don't know that I see her in the lineup. Is she here? I'm here, Bonnie. Oh, okay, great. She's out of my hometown. Uh, Christine Conley. Thank you, um, everyone. You can see this is the struggle that I have at my day job is the sun and my position of the window for this 20 minutes that I happen to be uh, called upon. So I appreciate the the struggle of the sun every day. Um, I also really do appreciate uh, the endorsement from the realtors. I think um, I, I appreciate what Joe Courtney said and how he's really trying to help get some federal dollars back down to the state of Connecticut. And we do appreciate especially in Grant his work to keep our shipyard busy and growing because um, those are our real jobs here and folks who have these jobs, all these folks have been working through COVID, working very hard, owning their houses, um, able to get new houses with, with their union raises um, with their new contract. So we are working together hard in Eastern Connecticut and I hope that I hear a little bit more um, positivity out of speakers that will go next because as we have been working together, we have been working, I've been working together on EWIB to make sure that our um, schools and our classes and our training is strong. I've also been working together to make sure with Joe Courtney that EB is strong and working on the Transfer Act, what we did last week was great bipartisanship, um, great leadership by the Democratic Party and folks following to make sure that um, we can do some smart legislation that's both business friendly and environmentally friendly. And if we keep those attitudes on how to work strong together, we can continue to have a strong state. I know when I've been doing doors, um, the amount I'm welcoming the new New Yorkers who have been renting and buying down here, um, working at Electric Boat and other great places. So I appreciate my new neighbors and together we will keep more neighbors, more people buying houses and a stronger economy. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Christine. Um, next up is a, a, a candidate, Lauren Gauthier. Hi, good morning, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm just really appreciative to be here today and, and talk a little bit because um, I'm in a, a unique position for a lot of people my age being a homeowner at 24. And I, I, that's really just down to my husband and I meeting each other, fortunately, very young and having this vision. And I think that, um, you know, moving forward, what we need to do is capture the folks that have been historically leaving uh, by making homeownership affordable and life in Connecticut affordable. Uh, I'd really like to see Connecticut help and empower municipalities to do what they need to in their own unique way to make their specific place of living more attractive to 
uh, those, those millennials like myself that have been leaving after college uh, to start careers elsewhere. So in addition to having jobs here, we also have to have a place that people want to live. And I think that really is created by the communities themselves. Um, and further, I just, uh, I think it's amazing that we do have this influx of, of new people and what can we do to make sure that after this pandemic is uh, defeated and we move forward, that we keep them here and that they don't decide to leave afterwards. I really do look forward to working with various different coalitions to come up with new solutions to make Connecticut, maybe not necessarily the next uh, place where we have a Boston or a New York City, but definitely our own unique character where we can address some of the very vital needs of affordable housing, of job creation and good jobs. You know, uh, I saw a recent study that despite having some job increases prior to the pandemic, they weren't necessarily the best paying jobs. So really balancing everyone's interests and being able to create something new for the future and, and for families like myself. So thank you again for, for giving this opportunity. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, out of uh, District 42 is uh, Representative Mike France. Thank you, Bonnie, for the introduction. I want to thank East Connecticut Association of Realtors for hosting this legislative forum. Uh, as well as Connecticut Realtors for their endorsement. Uh, I think that is one of the uh, indicators of the work that I've done in the legislature in promoting the home ownership. And the basis for that is actually a strong economy and jobs that uh, allow people to come in and buy a home and afford to live in Connecticut. Um, one of the challenges that I've seen uh, as we are facing the challenges of the pandemic and how we navigate that is, you know, starting to think now, even before we had for how we are going to navigate our way out and what does the legislature can do to facilitate uh, a growth in the economy. Uh, and as Senator Austin talked about, the uh, Work Workforce Investment Board, uh, the Manufacturing Association, Eastern Connecticut are strong indicators of programs that work. Uh, certainly they reach out to the uh, community, they understand the industry that is in our region uh, and provide programs that will enhance that opportunity and provide jobs that will allow people to afford to purchase homes and live in Eastern Connecticut. Uh, one of the things that has always been a challenge is the high cost of living relative to around the country, uh, but that has also been in the past uh, offset by a relative high uh, average income to afford the great quality of life that we have in, uh, in Connecticut. So I look forward to working together uh, as we have on many of the economic factors in our state. Uh, the uh, region and legislators in our Eastern Connecticut region have worked together on numerous things. I look forward to continuing that effort uh, in promoting an economic recovery as we uh, safely navigate out of this pandemic uh, into the next year and see strong growth in uh, our, both our region and across our state. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, next up is uh, out of District 43 is Kate Rotella. Hi, thank you so much um, for having this today. Um, it was great to get to hear everything and meet everybody. Um, you know, I would say that the pandemic certainly has um, reminded us as how important it is for all of us to work together. And I would say in Southeastern Connecticut, we do try to work um, together really a lot. Um, small businesses are a large part of our, our business sector here in Connecticut and realtors are a large part portion of that um, business sector. We are doing great things in Connecticut. We have worked together to try to make the business climate friendlier um, within this state. We've had manufacturing expansion programs that have gone through in addition to training programs so that we have a workforce that's ready to get into those jobs that are higher paying jobs. Um, we thank Joe Courtney for his hard work and continuing to get us larger defense contracts down to our district. So that's bringing new jobs and new people into our area. Um, the Transfer Act, uh, a couple people have talked about already, was a great bill um, and a bi that was passed in a bipartisan fashion. And I'm really proud that we were able to work on that together. I think there's lots of different processes and philosophies we need to embrace to attract and grow and retain business businesses. Um, we've had some incentive programs that's worked really well. Um, the angel investor tax has been one of them. Um, and again, you know, I just want to say thank you. Um, but it is important that we work together. Um, I, 
I will look forward to seeing what the federal government can do to help us with the um, rent moratorium. I think that's going to be a big um, thing that we will need to watch. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Next up is a candidate out of the 46th district, Robert Bell. <clears throat> All right, now I'm unmuted. Thank you for having me. I'm Robert Bell. 40, I'm running for the 46th District House of Representatives, uh, is, which represents most of Norwich. Uh, I welcome my colleagues here. I am a realtor, been a realtor since 2009. I'm a real estate investor. I'm currently building an inn just outside of downtown Norwich. I own a cooperative office space in downtown Norwich. And uh, I just want to talk about uh, some of the positivity, like uh, although all, we, we do have some really great positive things going on, with our, especially with our real estate market now, unfortunately, as legislators, which I hope to be uh, as uh, come, come January, um, we get the brunt of the negativity. Uh, I want to throw out there, as we all understand that um, what we're seeing in our market right now, this huge influx of sales and, and home selling for 20,000 plus over asking price, we need to take that as a warning for a correction that will come to, later down the road as we work through this pandemic. Uh, so I want to uh, uh, reach out to those who are currently sitting in legislation to actually that we need to start the conversation now about what's going on with the eviction moratoriums and how the landlords are taking all the brunt of, er of everything. They're, they're not getting rents, they're, uh, they're, they have to pay their mortgage, their taxes, their insurance, and, and everything is on the back of the landlord now. So we need to start the conversation now uh, to, to uh, in the sh near future, uh, provide them relief um, so that uh, we don't affect a higher market crash later on down the road. So let's not kick the can. Let's start the conversation now. And uh, I look forward to serving you next year. Great, thank, thank you. you. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Next up is um, out of District 53 is Representative Pat Wilson Phineas. Good morning, everybody. And thank you very much. Thank you also for the endorsement. This is my first one with Realtors, and so I'm introducing myself to, you, to many of you. Um, I've been, uh, I represent um, Ashford, Tolland, and Wellington, the 53rd district, and I have since 2018. This is coming to the end of my first term and running for a second. I have been a resident of Ashford um, since 1955. <laughs> I'm a homeowner, homeowner um, and I own 14 acres of land of woods in Connecticut. I am the vice chair of human services committee, and I also serve on the children's committee, the labor and public employees committee, and I'm a, a co-chair of the Crumbling Caucus Foundation, along with Senator Champagne um, and, and Senator Anwar and Representative Del, Del Mickey. I'm a Yukon grad. Uh, I went through undergraduate. I got a law degree, my law degree and social work degree. I'm an attorney. I spent most of my uh, career in education, however. Um, the impact of COVID-19 has devastated us all and it's put people that have never known need in situations of great need. So I'm very concerned about managing the immediate recovery as a foundation for our future growth. I think that we have to ensure the basics of our economy. People need help with living subsidies until they can return to work. Um, extended unemployment must be federally authorized and state supported. I think we have to pay attention to the, the kids um, in that the COVID has devastated our, our you know, um, our education system. And I think we have to put a lot of energy to that. I think until we get on top of this disease, we can't begin to effectively rebuild. And so things like the mask mandate and enforcing that and not taking as, as uh, an excuse uh, the argument of fairness over public health. I think those things are important. I think we have to focus on mental health and physical health insurance that is going to be lacking or is no, no longer or we tied to jobs. We have to fix that. I think we have to focus on the things of, of accurate testing, better protocols in nursing homes, a bunch of stuff. But moving forward, because I know I'm running out of time. Oh, I'm out of time. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much. Um, I guess we missed uh, out of District 45, Brian Lanou. 
Okay, I got a, a good morning. There he is. How are we doing? Good morning, Eastern Connecticut Realtors. Uh, Brian Lanou, I'm the uh, current state representative from the 45th uh, House District, comprising of five towns uh, here in Eastern Connecticut, Griswold, Sterling, Voluntown, Springfield, and Lisbon. And I am currently seeking my second term in the uh, House. Um, I want to thank the uh, Realtors of Eastern Connecticut for helping make in the American dream a reality for so many people here in my district and throughout uh, Eastern Connecticut. Uh, home ownership is certainly uh, that um, the American dream and realtors play such a pivotal pivotal role in helping shepherd and shepherd the uh, people through that process, which for most people will be their largest financial investment. Um, I want to make sure we have a long term robust uh, real estate market here in Eastern Connecticut, a robust housing market. Uh, in order to achieve this American dream, I think we need to we need to have uh, make sure we have a, a climate in Hartford that supports our, our, our realtors, supports our businesses. Uh, we need to um, we need to encourage our business and industry to come here to locate here for our small businesses to grow, to have the meaningful long term jobs, uh, sustainable employment. If people have higher paying jobs, uh, uh, better employment. That's what that is. What will lead to a the uh, the, the dream of a uh, a more sustainable housing market. So that's something I'm going to be focusing on uh, in my uh, tenure as a representative. I have done that over the last couple of years. Um, I want to make sure we have a climate in Hartford that encar um, encourages um, a, a more friendly uh, business market. I think lowering the uh, I proposed a bill to lower the uh, corporate tax in Connecticut also requiring uh, a state agency that imposes any new regulation that they have to get rid of through existing regulations. We have to cut the red tape. We Thanks have to cut so the, uh, the tax. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brian. And um, last but not least, is uh, Kevin Ryan, representative out of District 139, still here? I don't see him on the list, but. I am here. Oh, okay, great. I Sorry, I, I can leave. No, 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 absolutely. I, I was looking at the participant list. I'm it. sorry. Um, thank you. Thanks for having me. And I did, I unfortunately did get into this late because I typically teach on Wednesday mornings, but because of the COVID virus, the classes at the University of New Haven have been canceled. Uh, so I am available and was, was happily able to join you today. Uh, I look forward to this meeting every year to see the real estate, the hardworking real estate people of Eastern Connecticut come together to discuss real estate in Eastern Connecticut. And um, I think one of the issues that we should be talking about is the COVID virus, the effect it's had on business, the effect it's had on homeowners and landowners, uh, landlords, excuse me. And I know a number of my colleagues have spoken to this issue, but I think it's been, well, I understand the purpose for the moratorium on evictions. It is quite honestly adversely affecting landlords. Uh, some of these privileges have been somewhat abused and landlords are feeling the brunt of it. Uh, not making, being able to make some of the payments they're required to make, as we heard from other folks earlier. So I think that what we can do at the federal level, and again, thank Joe Courtney for his uh, work at the federal level to get rental assistance so that the, these folks that are renting can pay their landlords so the landlords aren't another victim of this pandemic. That's going to be important. And again, we want to talk about bringing business back after the pandemic. Uh, we want our workers to return. Uh, during the last session, we did eliminate the business entity tax. And we should look to repeal the state sales tax on employer training programs. And many people mentioned the fact that we need to retrain workers to get them back into the workforce. And we need to continue to support our workforce development programs uh, to ensure that they train people for a very good in-demand job. And we should also look at the apprenticeship tax credit program, uh, which should be expanded to include small manufacturers and the research and development tax credit, which should be reinstated instituted with the promotion of private sector investment, because that's going to be important to keep the economy of Southeastern Connecticut very vital. Um, I do have another event to go because this ran a little bit long, so I think I will end there so that I can get to that next event. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And and if I did, did I miss anybody else? I, otherwise, we are through our candidates. And I didn't see any um, text questions, so... Um, 
appreciate all these wonderful candidates for showing up. And uh, I think we can move on to the next part of the program. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome, Bonnie. I'd like to thank you as our president elect for 2021. And I'd like to also thank all of the legislators and candidates for being here with us today. The, now I'd like to introduce um, and extend our sincere thanks uh, and appreciation to our loyal affiliates as you know we're, we have to adapt to this virtual world and I thank, uh, thank them for their patience in going to the tail end of this meeting. I'm going to start with our diamond sponsors and I know we sh might have still on the call um, just Dustin from Green Home Solutions. Dustin here still? Law Office of Chris Albanese. Dave Johnston was on the call. Oh, he, uh, he had to leave. Um, Dave is with Prime Lending. And I'm not sure if we still have Tom Morgan. Tom, if you want to unmute yourself, you have an opportunity to say something. Hi, Greg. April, hey. hello. How are you? I'm well. Right now we're at a home inspection in uh, Westbrook. So Tom is busy and I'm speaking for him. I wanna thank everyone for having organized this meeting. It's been very informative. And uh, the question I thought was really interesting and thought would be uh, something to carry on was how has the New York um, influx affected the homes in Connecticut and it's just really for home inspections has just bumped some things up so much and um, really has given a, a shot in the arm to certainly to our business and to hopefully others who are on this uh, call now and also just throughout the state of Connecticut. So I um, wanted to say thank you for organizing this this zoom meeting and we continue to service and provide septic inspections water testing termite inspections home inspections and follow up to any questions that buyers might have thank you so much thank you april and i'm going to circle back to dave johnson since he's not here to speak for himself i do want to point out since we have legislators on the call uh, and candidates. One of the products that Dave's got is a uh, renovation mortgage product. It is helping revitalize our communities and taking the homes that really need uh, updates and repairs. It's all providing, that's an avenue and a pathway for affordable housing also because we can take these homes and get them updated. Prime Lending is a great resource for that. Good back end team. Plant sponsors. Um, we have Anchor Home Inspections. And I'll bet you Ryan is up on a roof right now doing a roofie and doing his inspection. Surely at Eastern Connecticut Savings Bank. And of course, uh, we've got John Peck for uh, Peck and Tanisky Law Firm out of New London. John is a co-counsel and um, platinum sponsor. Moving on to our gold sponsors, we've got Commissions Express. And I do have, and Keith, if you can unmute yourself, um, we've got Keith Turner from Homestead Funding. You're on, Keith. Good, mor good morning, Ecar. Uh, this is Keith Turner representing all of Connecticut, seeking your vote for uh, your mortgage lender. Uh, no, just, um, just wanted to say uh, thanks for everybody's loyalty uh, this year. Um, it's been a great year so far. Um, just added two new processors to assist my processor to help uh, speed up those approvals. And then we're in the process of adding and training six new closers so we can get back to our uh, three-day closings by the end of this month. Um, we're here, obviously we're here for your mortgage needs. Our conventional loans are uh, you know, nearing down to about two and a half, 2.625 rates, just kind of almost free money at this point. Um, so some of the, we're seeing a, a couple, of what could have been cash buyers actually uh, finance um, their mortgage and keep their money in their in their market, making them more money. Um, but yeah, conventional FHA, VA, USDA loans, Jaffa as well, of course. Um, and then just our position as a lender um, allows us to underwrite in-house, so we can get a little flexible if we need to uh, with those underwriting guidelines to help make sure um, 
to, to make sure that we are uh, bringing these guys to the closing table for you. Um, once again, Keith Turner of Homestead Funding, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks. And I'll put a footnote after Keith's name, Affiliate of the Year 2020, ECAR. Question for Keith, what is the FHA rate today? Um, depends on the credit score, so I can't really quote it, but we've been seeing those probably at about just south of three, so 2875, 275. And apologies for the condition of the office. Um, we had a late fall, uh, you can see up there. So we're in the midst of getting some LED lights and redoing this, so maybe I should just be holding the camera this way. Um, looks a little bit better, so. Awesome, and uh, our third gold sponsor is Sunrise Home Inspection. And Kevin is, I'm sure, out on a inspection also. Moving on to our silver sponsors, and I will list all three of them. We've got uh, Chelsea Groton Bank. We've also got uh, Coastal Home Inspection. We've got Sava Insurance Group. And we've got Tiger Home and Building Inspections. And as a reminder, I want to um, spotlight, and if everybody could just pull out a notepad or just take a look at your calendar, the Spooktacular Fun Drive is happening on Friday, October 23rd. Uh, the food can be dropped off uh, at any time up until the uh, food drive if you're not gonna be in the area. And I'm really wanting to see eCar. Um, we had a great event with the uh, shred event in the beginning of this pandemic, but let's, let's bring it on home with um, some real good uh, contributions and donations for the um, uh, charitable uh, and education foundation at the Spooktacular on Friday the 23rd. And the times are going to be from uh, 4 p.m. to 6.30. It's a fundraiser uh, that will be um, it, it ending up in the e-car parking lot. We'll have pizza, beverages, games, and a live DJ to uh, liven things up a little bit. And one other thing I want to spotlight in terms of one of my 2020 initiatives, the e-car care club. As many members are having a uh, banner year, I'm asking each of you to uh, consider stepping up if you already haven't been part of the eCar Care Club. It is a, um, a five dollar transaction um, commitment and donation to the eCar Care Club. Those dollars, I want to spotlight. Those dollars are so important this year because we're not going to be able to have our um, annual uh, 2020 uh, December um, community benefit raffle. Last year, ECAR raised $17,000 and we were able to put that to work in 21 local charities. So we need you to step up and ECAR Care Club is a best way to do it, $5 pledge. And with that, uh, I will conclude our uh, legislative uh, membership meeting. I hope you all enjoyed today's legislative updates. They were uh, uh, you know, very, uh, meaningful in terms of the information that was provided, I think. And please stay healthy, safe, and continue to mask up uh, while conducting business. That's it for now. Thank you.